Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Fletcher Wolf, cinematographer of As My My Love. You can find me at FletcherWolf.com and on Instagram at Fletcher underscore Wolf. Wolf has an E at the end. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. Of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented and creative person. She's, of course, a cinematographer, which is wonderful because she is the very first cinematographer I've ever had on Two Geeks Talking. She is going to be talking about our brand new film that I just spoke to an amazing director, Corey Choi, on most recently. And when this interview airs, it's going to be right after Corey's interview. So win-win, you get double the SMA, my love, and two of the amazing, talented people. We'll have Stacey on after this interview as well, too. We're joined by the ever-talented Fletcher Wolf. How are you doing today? I'm great. How are you, Kurt? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for asking. I'm going to ask this question first before I jump to who you are and what you're bringing to the show. What is a cinematographer? The cinematographer, sometimes also called director of photography or DP, collaborates with the director to design the and achieve the look of the film. So it's camera placement, you know, what are the shots telling us about what's going on internally with the characters? How does it see the space, the world they live in? What is the lighting, the mood, the texture of the image? So everything. <laughs> I mean, not the sound <laughs> and, and not the production design. You know, it's a big collaboration, but the photography is what we do. Well, now my question is, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, I guess I'm the first to interview head on. So hopefully I can shed some light on the, what we do, our process. Um, I grew up in Boston, moved to New York for undergrad, loved theater and photography in high school. And when it came time to apply to undergrad, realized Cinema is those two things put together. So those are two of my great loves, as is cinema now. I don't know. I hope to shed some light on the other crew members that make movies possible, because I think a lot of people, like even my parents, who have heard me talk about my work for eight, the 18 years I've been doing this, still are amazed at how many moving parts there are. I went back to school for visual arts and film, so I was more of a producer, editor. Those that have the eye and the talent for, for cinematography is way above my pay grade and what I could even hope to accomplish. <laughs> Well, we, it's, I mean, every, a, a film needs everyone, you know, it needs people who are great at sound, people who are great at dressing a set or, you know, thinking up what, what would this character have in their home? You know, I don't have those expertise, but we all have to come together to make the same vision. Teamwork makes the dream work, something like that. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Estimate My Love, of course, is your most recent project, at least as of this interview here. And I'm sure you have many in the future we'll, we'll definitely talk about for sure, but what was your experience on SMA My Love and how did that differ from, say, some of your previous works? I think we could talk about my works as a large scope, including, you know, how I, I came up as a lighting technician. And that's where I learned to light and how to run a crew. And that those were typically larger jobs than Esme. Esme My Love is a wonderful film, but it, you know, it had its challenges in that it was a micro budget thriller, very small crew, very small cast, which was actually kind of wonderful because we really got to know them very well. And you know, we spent every day with Stacey and Audrey. And I'd say, yeah, I'd say this is one of the more intimate projects I've done because of the size of the cast and crew. One of the more challenging ones I've done because, you know, our principal photography was only 13 days just due to budget. We did add some pickup days after that. Yeah, I mean, I think what informed my work on this and sort of a through line is that, you know, the the work I had done in lighting on larger projects, of course, you know, gives you the tools to sort of think about how to tackle different projects. And then my work as a DP or cinematographer on documentaries also informed this project because we were working in the woods with a lot of natural light and 
limited ability to control it. Uh, you know, so we were using very run and gun minimal tools to try to shape the world and give it a mood. Does that give you a bit of freedom or does it add more complexity to your style of shooting? Hmm. Yeah, I think you have to, I mean, ideally you find locations that work well for the film because then you can embrace them and you're not fighting what's on screen. And having minimal tools, yeah, I, I do find that some strictures do help me be creative because if you're given the world, you know, it's almost like, where do you start? Well, Corey mentioned something in his interview and it was two scenes in particular and please add any more challenging scenes that you had to shoot as well. One was a, a diving scene uh, that Stacy had to go through and the other was a car scene with a car that didn't quite work very well. <laughs> yeah. We, I, I guess I should feel a little bad because I pushed to use that as picture car because it was so, it just looked good on camera, you know, it was like a 1990 boxy, you know, thing I remember from my childhood, sort of made me think of the woods and, you know, it had trouble starting sometimes. The underwater scene was definitely challenging. Um, we had tried to do all of it on our last day of principal photography upstate, way upstate in Hague, New York and Lake George took boats out to an island because this place had a great dock. And we we got all of the um, above water stuff there, the stuff in the canoe, the stuff on the dock. But yeah, when it came time to get the stuff that was underwater or partially underwater, there was a leak in the, the underwater camera housing. The water was too murky to see anything. Things that, you know, on a bigger budget film, you maybe you've scouted, you know, you've, you've been able to do more prep to sort of like fix all these issues. So anyway, we didn't really get the underwater stuff. We got a lot of that as pickups later in a pool, which was a much more controlled environment. <laughs> I would say that uh, that and generally the short principal filming schedule were probably the biggest um, hurdles in my mind. The actresses working on these films are really amazing. And, and I can't wait to speak with Stacey about this uh, as well, too. And, and everyone's experience, like I said, you know, being a micro budget, being a small set and a small community of amazing, talented filmmakers like yourself and, and Corey and everyone there just seems like a wonderful experience. It's things that I miss that I, I'm hoping to get back to fairly soon in the next couple of months. But being a cinematographer and, and a DP that you are here, you know, how did you convey emotions and character development through your cinematography? I mean, that is where, that's where I start every narrative project. Of course, you know, our job is to translate the psychology and emotions of the characters and their character arcs and emotional beats into technical choices. But yeah, I think the, you know, the most interesting part of the job is, is how do you make those choices, tell the audience something more than purely just physically what's going on on screen. You know, they could be having a conversation about going uh, to a friend's birthday party, but, you know, what's, the question is, what is really going on? You know, it's that, like, they're avoiding talking about their breakup, or, you know. So in this film in particular, uh, obviously, we're spending the whole movie with two people. From the beginning, Corey really wanted the forest around them to kind of be a third character. It's it's an important presence. It, uh, it not only creates sort of a spooky mood, but it affects, you know, how they, how they act as the movie goes on. We also realized when breaking down the script together that the movie kind of starts from Hannah's perspective, like you sort of experiencing the world through her mind or how she, you know, what she believes is going on. And then as things sort of fall apart about halfway through, it switches to her daughter Esme's perspective. And, you know, hopefully viewers don't notice that switch. It's gradual and it's, it's subtle choices, but it should be affecting you emotionally that, you know, where you sort of, it should be destabilizing that you realize the person you sort of trusted as not a literal narrator, but emotional narrator, someone who's guiding us through the story. You can no longer trust what she was telling us was going on. And then you, then you have to follow the nine-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> what are some shots that you can rely on that are either cinematic classics or shots that you haven't seen in cin in cinematography in a very long time? That's interesting. I mean, I think everything's been done forever. I mean, you know, I think that there was, there was a, maybe about 10 years ago, you know, handheld got really popular again and people were acting like it was a new thing. It was like, James Wong Howe used handheld on roller skates in a boxing ring in the 1920s. 
Yeah, great ideas have have been mostly been done before. But I mean, I think that one of the core things pretty much always go to in narrative is the question of how close is the camera to the person it's trained on. And that really speaks to whose scene is it, you know, if we're experiencing this event through someone's, you know, tense emotions and anxiety, we're likely going to have the camera on a probably fairly wide angle lens quite close up to them. And of course, you know, close ups of faces and great performances is always going to be wonderful on screen and that's sort of the core of cinema but you know if we're experiencing something someone's doing from our protagonist's perspective you know I may place the camera further away on a somewhat longer lens because it gives a sense of removal so I think that like the, a, a big thing for me that I always go to is how close or far is the camera from this person and and why what has been some I, either in SMA My Love or, or other films that you've you've shot or series? What are some performances that just took your breath away while you're shooting? Wow, there def- there's been a lot of times when I've been operating and and you know found myself tearing up. It actually happens on documentaries a lot because people are often sharing really you know, different performances. They're they're sharing you know real parts of their life, really difficult stuff. And on documentaries, I'm often also pulling my own focus and, you know, one man band, it's very verite. And I'm thinking like, oh gosh, I hope it's in focus. I can't see through my tears. Um, And I think on narrative stuff, uh, you know, comedy often just gets us all. Well, it's so hard sometimes to not laugh and ruin a take. But yeah, and and on Esme specifically, both Stacey and Audrey are amazing. But I will say that, you know, working with Audrey when she was just nine and seeing how professional and talented she was, was definitely very, very striking um, and something I'll always remember. It's great to see a project or a trajectory of their career, I should say, uh, you know, from where they start to where they eventually will go. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to see where these two amazing actresses are, are going to continue on their career the same with yourself though as well too being a professional for 18 years is is an amazing accomplishment in itself what was the first film that made you want to become a cinematographer i don't know that i remember an exact moment but it was sort of going getting into film school and learning what a cinematographer does that i realized like that's the job for me uh it's a perfect pairing of creative and technical i will say that todd haynes's film Velvet Goldmine made a big impression on me in high school because it was one of the first films I saw that just sort of threw out the window that you know you need to make the audience believe a world that cinema is a is a realistic medium it's not he fully embraces that it's it's a it's a fantastical medium you know you can do a, a very slice of life thing that feels very real or you could do you know a Velvet Goldmine which is a a treatise on glam rock that just does whatever it wants. Yeah, I'd say, my, you know, that movie really opened my mind up to the breadth of styles that cinema can explore. It's also amazing seeing different cinematic films from, you know, look at Asia cinematography, you look at uh, North American, European cinematography, whether it's experimental or established or indie for that matter. It's, it's just amazing seeing different viewpoints in different cultures in terms of how they shoot things as well, too. I think that's incredible. Absolutely. I agree. And I think a lot of the cinema that I've found most inspiring lately has been coming out of Europe and East Asia. You know, obviously Parasite, the the list of Korean films goes on. And recently, um, Corsage um, from Austria and, and Happening from France. I think what I'm connecting with is something that the American cinema world hasn't really been putting money into lately be kind of because superhero movies have taken over theaters and budgets but you know it's it's cinema that honing in on one or two characters and really digging into what's going on with them and and how they're feeling so it's really character driven yeah you look at all the scripts that have been made well there are no new stories from what people say it's just a different viewpoint and how they change it's color theory color theory and lighting is something i think that needs to be readdressed in this day and age because we're so used to computerized graphics taking a step back and, and looking at the color scheme in, in sma my love i mean beautiful blues and earthy tones and everything like that i don't think you could have gone wrong with your setting the only thing that i think could have changed was if it was winter time 
Sure. Yeah, that shooting in the winter would have made it so much harder than it already was. <laughs> Just access to the woods. Like I said, Corey wanted the woods to be a third character. So, you know, we're very much leaning into the tones that are there, browns, greens, and that dusky blue. You know, we spent a long time in the color grade getting things just right because we didn't you know the, the locations were what they were we didn't have a ton of control of certainly over the exteriors I mean it is what it is Kyra Bostelli our production designer you know did a lot of work in the house interior where we had some more control over the mise-en-scene over like what we were actually filming but for the most part it was like a battle of green and I actually love green. I kind of, I kind of am averse to magenta, but then that came up in the color grade, you know, trying to sort of play down the greens to some extent so they weren't nuclear uh, and neon, you know, not pulling our attention and, and also not letting skin tones go magenta. So yes, color theory is very important. Averse to magenta. That's the first time I've heard that. Yeah. I just really Do, don't like it. <laughs> was, there, was there a set you just got overloaded on it? Uh... No, no, it's just my, it's just my personal taste of, of what I want a cinematic image to look like. Yeah, I think magenta and skin tones is, is not my favorite thing. Is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like me to ask you or showcase or share with those that are watching and listening to this interview? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'd love to, I mean, I always love to, you know, highlight the, you know, I spent eight years as a lighting technician and gaffer. And I think that, you know, for me, and actually for a lot of folks, you know, that that time working your way up the ladder and seeing how things are done by different people and on larger projects, you know, is huge in informing how you work once you become the boss and, and are directing crews. You know, it's, it's important to know not only what those roles are what you know what your keys what your gaffer your key grip what everyone does but how to merely say to them i would like to achieve blank and know that you know they're going to figure out the details better than you can imagine it because you know because you spent that time being in that position you know i think those years as a technician um hugely inform my work and how i work with others and how i collaborate Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? And you can give one for each lighting and cinematography. Oh, my gosh. The only thing that comes to mind off the top of my head, and clearly this has stuck with me, so maybe it's the, the wisest, but could be second wisest, was a, a good friend of mine who is a career gaffer. He's phenomenal. But back when I was working for him, you know, he, he asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want a DP. And he said, oh, well, in that case, you have to start shooting. You know, this like doing the work that informs it is important and useful. But the only thing that's actually going to get you into what you want to do is doing what you want to do. It's a bit of a catch-22, especially if saying no to paid work in order to take unpaid work for, you know, about a year. It's how long it took me, I think, to make the switch. You know, if that's not something you can do because you don't have a nest egg that's you know that's problematic and I know there's exclusionary issues with that you know he gave me the courage to take the leap start turning down you know lighting department work in in order to make the jump to cinematographer that always stuck with me because he he really just kind of laid it down you know he didn't couch it in anything he was like you just got to do it and he was right what, was it difficult to transition? Was it, even though you were passionate about it, was it a difficult? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of aspects about it that, that were challenging. Um, you know, it's difficult. Number one, I already mentioned it's difficult to turn down paid work, you know, and especially I loved lighting. It was paid work that I loved doing, but I just had to say, no, I'm trying to do this now. It's difficult to convince producers and directors and your peers that, you know, you can do a thing they haven't seen you do. My friend said, you kind of just have to start doing it to convince people you can. It was also, you know, I had to learn, I had to remember sort of the camera side of things and, and, you know, learn how to break down scripts and collaborate with directors, work more closely with producers. And uh, yeah, it's certainly, you know, there's a, a new set of skills that I had to learn as well. So from the communication side of things, uh, obviously you're working with many different departments. What's the easiest and most difficult part about the communication side of things as a DP? 
I think easiest for me is being there on set with people and being in the space and, you know, with collaborators who work with for a long time, you know, we can kind of just point and people work for the really long time. Sometimes after a take, you know, my gaffer, one of my favorite gaffers, Alexa here, Mitsu, she'll just like, I'll see her at monitor and I'll look at her and she'll turn around and go, the thing. And we we're talking about the exact same thing. We're like, it needs a, yeah. Um, that to me is the easiest, just, you know, we're working with people that, that we were, we know each other really well and we're both there on set. I think one of the most difficult things, you know, finding the tools and prep that allow, you know, me to help me visualize and get those ideas somehow onto paper, digital, whatever it is, just get them into a format that other people can see. So we all know the direction we're headed. It can feel tedious. Sometimes it can feel like spinning wheels. Um, and sometimes it'll a lighting diagram and go like, I know what I want this to look like, but then it's just represented by little little cartoons and then you hand it over and hope your rigging gaffer or whoever, you know, knows what you're going for. Um, so yeah, before before things are actually happening, it can all seem a little a little nebulous. How important is a shot list to a DP? It depends on the project. Um, there are some films, I always start on an era project with the, the sort of psychological, emotional undercurrent reading of the script, which then informs the shot listing. And honestly, you know, for a feature, usually the director and I spend two to three weeks shot listing. It takes a long time. And with a film like Esme, My Love, which is a thriller, so it's very much about specific moments. We have to hit certain beats and you have to only give the audience information at specific times. Otherwise, you've ruined, you know, the the mood and the thrill. Um Shot listing is very important and it really kind of has to be designed ahead of time um, because you're doling out information bit by bit very carefully. Um, in other films, you know, we may just say, okay, for this scene, we know we need to cover this person and that person and we want a wide to encompass them. But, you know, it may be a more uh, performance-based film and maybe the director wants the actors to have some freedom, in which case... Um, have a very we might have a sort of bare bones shot list and then uh, you know when blocking at a blocking rehearsal on the day when we start doing a scene we actually work out what's happening and, and then we nail down what the coverage is for certain parts of the scene um, so it really depends on the nature of the project yeah no I mean I think a big part of the DP's job a big part of our responsibility is figuring out how to not only get what we want and what we need on screen, but make our days. No one wants to go into OT. It happens. It happens a lot, but you know, I feel like if I can, if I can help us make our days, then I'm doing my job right. You, I mean, you also have to fight to get, you know, to make it look good and make it look like you and the director want it, but there's always a balance, always a uh, balancing that with reality and time. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I'd say there's probably a lot of people who inspired me. I'm going to go with one of my cinematography professors in undergrad. His name was Tom Mangraviti. He was like in his 80s, been teaching for a while. He had been like a big fashion DP in the 60s in New York. And before that, he had helped invent the touchtone telephone. I mean, this guy was a legend. And I just liked his style. I liked how he worked on set. He kind of had this old school, like, yeah, just get it done. And I kind of yell at everyone, but it's nice yelling. And um, <laughs> he inspired me to, you know, kind of when I met him, I knew that this was indeed a job I wanted to do. From a professional standpoint, you have been in the industry for 18 years as a, well, an amazing, not only lighting technician, as well as a cinematographer. I'm sure you're going to do many amazing things in the future that we just don't have time to talk about today, which means you have to come back on and talk about your future projects as well, too. So I can't wait to have you back on for that. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Um, I think there are projects I would like to be doing that I'm not yet. In A lot of that is market forces. As we speak, the Writers Guild is on strike. Um, you know, you may... Be familiar with some of the difficulties the film industry is having. Yeah, when I look back at the relationships of you know built with directors I've worked with and, and crew um, over the years, I'd say that I feel quite proud of that. And 
yes, feel feel successful in just sort of being able, you know, to make a career of, of freelancing in this industry. I think a lot of us can be hard on ourselves, you know, why oh, why am I not, you know, shooting Star Wars now? That's obviously, I went real high with that one. But, you know, I think it's good to take a step back and realize what you have accomplished and the fact that, you know, if you respect your peers and the people you work with, which I do, then I think, you know, you should be grateful for that. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Well, we're usually our own harshest critics. And sometimes to me, a failure is like eh, not being stoked on a shot and, you know, when I'm the color grade. Eh. And then people I respect and, and work with will be like, oh, it works great in the scene. You know, what's wrong with it? So I think like not getting hung up on things that you see as a personal failure is important, you know, certainly try to remember what you wish you had done differently and improve on it the next time, you know, and I think in order to take those, your own notes or notes from collaborators and put them into practice, you know, the next time you have to have some ability to not get hung up and set things aside. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a DP or something in the film industry that You've inspired them through our conversation today or professionally in your own regard. Maybe you've inspired them to do something amazing. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? With social media now, it's, it's easy to see people's work and reach out and say, how did you do that? Um, which is important. You know, it's great to talk and, you know, discuss amongst ourselves, you know, how, how we do the work. But it's also, I think it's really important to not jump straight to directing or DPing or production designing and not have done, you know, a, at least a few years of work, maybe lower down on the ladder, watching how people get it done. Take the inspiration and let that guide, you know, what you're paying attention to and what you're seeing as you work on other people's projects. And then that's certainly what I did. And I do think it is important to not sort of just rush into, you know, having a, an Instagram page that maybe looks pretty but maybe you don't have the experience to run a crew because yeah, inspiration, it, the look is part of it, but knowing how to achieve that and respect the dozens of people who are depending on you um, to run things well and, and with respect is equally part of the job. You have to know how to achieve the look well. You know, ask questions not just about how the image was achieved, but also why and who the who else who helped because it's a huge collaboration and then learn how to do things cons with everyone else in consideration and then pass that on hopefully to the generation following if your life was a film what would its title be and what would its soundtrack be oh oh no i've never thought of this <laughs> um My life was a film. It would probably be called. Um, I mean, honestly, the Great Muppet Caper, but that's already taken. Yeah. Oh man, I don't know. They call me Fletch. No, I'm kidding. You know, <laughs> even Fletch is taken too. Yeah. Um, darn you, Chevy Chase. <laughs> darn you, Chevy Chase. Yeah, man. Wow, what a great question. I don't. Know, it would take me a while to come up with this. I feel like titles are particularly hard to come up with. The soundtrack would be probably a, I have a very eclectic taste in music. So it would probably be a, a mix of um, musicals, Bob Fosse musicals, uh, some punk and hardcore. You know, I think rock musicals really, they really hit a spot for me because they combine those two. So big fan of Rocky Horror and Hedwig and all that. Well, Fletcher, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where can we find you on this wonderful world of the internet and anything else you'd like to promote? My website is just FletcherWolf.com. Wolf is spelled with an E, as you can see in the lower third. I'm on Instagram, also at Fletcher underscore Wolf. As I My Love has its own website, and it will be available streaming on June 2nd. Amazon, Apple, Google Play, and Tubi. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others. More like 1,200 by now. I've lost count. But you can find it on our website, tgtud.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Website's going through a revamp. So head on over to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. 
the podcast is back after 12 or so years because reasons and I'm only one person and it's two geeks talking.podbean.com or just search for two geeks talking on iTunes, Spotify, and all of your other favorite streaming services that you get your podcasts on. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on two geeks talking.